welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Welcome to another edition of Mad in America Radio. I am Robert Whitaker, and I am very pleased to have as our guest today, Peter Sterling. Peter is a lifelong political activist, a well-known neuroscientist who has retired from the University of Pennsylvania, and an ethnographer. He lives now part-time in a rural part of Panama. We're here to talk about his recent book, What is Health? I became fascinated by this book after watching one of his talks in which he stated that the book was meant to address this question, which I found very provocative. What does our species require for a healthy life, and can we achieve this with drugs? This is a question with obvious relevance to psychiatry, and we will explore that question in the next hour. Welcome, Peter. Thank you, Bob. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, and I thought it would be good to start with your history of political activism. And the reason is, in a way, it's that political activism that eventually led to a spark that in some ways inspired you eventually to write this book. And when I read about your life, I was a little surprised to read about how your parents were communists and you were a, uh, a red baby. Can you talk about how being raised in that environment actually stirred in you a life of political activism and and really an awareness of social inequality and wanting to do something about it. Sure, I'll try. So um, I was born in 1940 and my parents in the 1930s and the 1940s until about 1955 uh, were members of the uh, Communist Party of the United States of America. And what people don't realize now, because there's been, you know, uh, 60 years of vilification of the communists, is that it was a political party. It was a political movement, uh, which was fairly popular in many ways. They ran candidates for president, for uh, Congress, for city councils. They were organizers of unions. Uh, uh, The UAW was was very uh, dependent in the mid-1930s on the energy of communists. They wrote American literature of that period. Uh, Arthur Miller Maybe he wasn't a member of the Communist Party, but he was sentenced to a year in jail for refusing to answer questions to a congressional committee. He wrote The Crucible, which, is a, which was a parable about, about the witch hunts in, in the Salem in, in, in Massachusetts, where many people were murdered as witches. Arthur Miller's passport was removed, was lifted in 19, 1950, so he was unable to attend the opening of the crucible in London. So there was a uh, systematic persecution of communists. Many people were fired from their jobs and harassed by the FBI. My sister mentioned to me the other day in an email that uh, my mother says my father would wake up in the middle of the night hollering that uh, he has nothing. I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. He said wow. because. He would be stopped on the street in, in, in New York City uh, on his way to work by, by FBI people. So on the one hand, there was this tense environment in which my parents and their friends uh, and my kids I grew up with were politically uh, harassed. But there was also the excitement of actually working for the NACP, trying to uh, stop lynching, trying to prevent executions of black men, the standard sort of thing that was going on. And so there was a a social commitment. The ideal was, as Marx wrote in his 20s, in the Communist Manifesto, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. And you may argue about that, but that's what I was raised with, and that's that's what I believe. So that has motivated me to... uh, to investigate social problems. You were a freedom writer in in 1961. And as many people know, that was one of the landmark civil rights efforts at that time. I believe you were at Cornell then. Can you tell us about that experience? It was mid-May and uh, it was exam time. So um, when people decided to go uh, and I raised my hand, yeah, I'm going, I... uh, the next day, I went to my professors and I said, look, I'm, I'm going on this uh, trip. And uh, how about just giving me the grade that you got for me? And, you know, I'll see you in September or something. <laughs> <laughs> the thing started in Washington, D.C. Two buses were sent 
by the Congress of Racial Equality, which was a pacifist Christian group uh, integrated to test two Supreme Court decisions, one in 1946, one in 1960, that ruled against interstate uh, Jim Crow. So if you were traveling interstate, um, you should have facilities, uh, lunchrooms, bathrooms, and so on that were not segregated. And so this initially was a test to see whether the law would be enforced. And everything went fine until somewhere in, in, in South Carolina, John, John Lewis, the late John Lewis, was beaten when the bus stopped. And then when they crossed into uh, Alabama, that's when all hell broke loose. The bus was bombed. Uh, the, the, the riders were almost burned to death. They got out of this burning bus and then they, they had the crap beaten out of them. By mid-May, this had been such a uh, catastrophically violent series of events that CORE and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee called SNCC decided, no, we're going to do a massive resistance. And then they called for buses to converge on Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and fill the jails. So you went down there expecting to be arrested, to fill the jails of Jackson, Mississippi? Yeah, that was the idea. So we drove down with New York State license plates. We knew we would be stopped as we went through the South. And so we, when we crossed into Mississippi, we installed as the driver uh, one of our companions who was from Texas and who had a wonderful Texas drawl. And when we were stopped by the state police saying, well, you boys going to make trouble? And he said, no, no, we're just going <laughs> to visit my mammy and my pappy and we made it to New Orleans. There we were trained in nonviolent resistance in case we were attacked. And, and then we were sent by train because the FBI had intelligence that there was a mob waiting at the Mississippi state line to intercept uh, a bus and that uh, we would be safer by train. And so that's what we did. We, we sort of snuck into Jackson on the train. The police were waiting for us. They arrested us immediately. The charge was breach of the peace. And we were sent off to jail in uh, segregated paddy wagons singing a We Shall Overcome, which is, of course, a famous song. And I'm pointing it out to people now that We Shall Overcome was copyrighted by Pete Seeger, the, the famous folk singer, who was, in fact, a communist. Was it a formative experience for you? Did it give you any sort of incentive to go forward in life in a certain way or change your thinking, change your understanding of the United States? So did it give you optimism that social change could happen and you could have, play a role in that? Yeah, that, that's a very, very good point. Uh, number one, with the Freedom Rides themselves, 1961 started in mid-May. By November, it, it only took 400 riders, okay, half of whom were white from the north, the rest were largely Southern Black. And by November, the Interstate Commerce Commission had ruled against segregation in interstate commerce. And so that was a done deal. Imagine 400 students achieving this in a few months. Then in 1964, there was Mississippi Summer, where uh, the Southern Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee organized it. And, uh, and they registered voters in Mississippi, and they really changed the, uh, the Mississippi Democratic Party and the National Democratic Party. So by the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and, uh, you know, this was a huge, rapid change and lent uh, excitement to this, this movement. It becomes a, a reason for optimism, I think. Exactly. So you would graduate from Cornell. You go to, uh, I think it was called Western Reserve University at the time. It wasn't Case Western. Yes. You start becoming a neuroscientist. Tell us about the canvassing story and how that really begins you on a, a way to rethinking how the brain works and how health is related to environment. Okay, so around 1965, several years into my PhD uh, research, uh, which was on the connections between the, uh, the motor cortex and the spinal cord and the brain stem. And these are, these are neural connections that allow us to move and think and talk and behave. But I was still active in core and I was canvassing in this central area of Cleveland, very poor, totally black. Blacks in Cleveland were confined to the central area, two big ghettos. 
and they would they were not permitted to live outside the city. So I I would knock on doors and people would come to the door and I could see that their face was sagging. Very not everybody, but often they were limping. Their speech would be slurred, and uh, I'd never seen this before in a, in a white middle class community where I grew up. So I asked my professor who was a neurologist and who was studying these pathways, you're looking at a stroke. This is uh, brain damage due to hemorrhage often, and it's due to uh, hypertension, chronic hypertension. People at the time said, well, we don't know what causes hypertension. Gosh, it's something, maybe you eat too much salt, black people have bad genes, all kinds of mysterious explanations, which is still given in medical textbooks. Well, we don't really understand this. Well, this was the ghetto where my grandfather had been confined when when it was a Jewish ghetto. And my grandfather had had a stroke, early stroke and hypertension. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, maybe maybe this is social tension is related to hypertension. So you have this first idea. The hypertension may be related to the social tension with our normal conception of hypertension. It's an illness that occurs within the individual. You're raising a different thought here. <laughs> Something has happened in response to an environment that's very stressful. That's exactly right. So the question is, if social tension is the cause in some way of hypertension, it must act through the brain. So there must be pathways from our perceptions and our understanding and our experience of life to the, uh, to the parts of the body which control the blood pressure. And this was not the subject of my main research. It was sort of my, my night job. So I went on from Cleveland to uh, Boston to Harvard Medical School, where I did a, three years of postdoctoral study uh, uh, in the visual system. And then I got a job in, uh, as assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and established my own laboratory studying vision. But I began to read more about social tension and causes of high blood pressure and stuff like that. And I met some people there who also knew quite a bit about it, more than I did, um, particularly a guy named Joseph Iyer, who I collaborated with and began to systematically read about the nerves that were being discovered uh, that connected to the kidney and connected to the pancreas and connected to the blood vessels. And it became more and more apparent that the brain controls every cell in the body. And so I wrote this with Joe uh, Iyer in like 1981. Well, we published a paper in 1977, then in 1981, about how social conditions, including stresses, including divorce, bereavement, segregation and so on affect various brain systems that affect blood pressure. So I, I published this quite a long time ago and nothing much happened. So a person's in a stressful environment. Is the hypertension actually adaptive to that stress? Right. The way the body is organized is that the brain, it turns out, I mean, as I, as I have later come to understand, the whole purpose of the brain is to predict what we need as, as an individual organism and to modulate our biochemistry and our physiology and also our behavior to make sure that our body has just enough resources just in time. So the brain's job is to provide us with just enough just in time and then keep us going. And so sometimes when we are in an emergency state, it raises our level of alertness and our body activities. And it does that by, for example, raising the heart rate, telling the kidney, yeah, we're going to need some more uh, blood supply here. So pump in some salt water. We need to save salt water by constricting the blood vessels to raise the pressure. These mechanisms are normal part of our regulation. It goes up, it goes down. But the problem is that if you live under conditions where you're required to be alert every second uh, of your life for something uh, scary to happen, then the body adapts. The brain comes to predict that you're going to need high pressure. So it predicts, tells the kidney, 
pump in more salt water. It tells the blood vessels to constrict, the heart rate to go up. And this becomes your way of life. Eventually, these peripheral mechanisms adapt. If you Just like lifting weights. If you lift weights, your muscles thicken. If you raise your blood pressure chronically, your, your blood vessels thicken. They, they have muscles in them, and they thicken. So, so it becomes an adaptation. We're going to explore this a bit more because it's obviously so relevant to how to nurture good health in a society and good mental health in a society. But I have to jump ahead just one second with this. If you look at, you know, the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, it just looked at kids in, in their young ages, two, three, four, who have adverse experiences, divorce, they're not in safe environments, that sort of thing. You see all sorts of poor health down the line mental and physical. So it seems to me that your story here would actually be a model for explaining trauma. If you're in a stressful environment that we characterize as traumatic, you become on high alert. Your body is predicting that you come home and maybe you're going to get beat or whatever. Is, is that a, a fair analogy? It's not even an analogy. It's, it's part of the same thing. Yeah, it's about prediction. What's really key here at this point is you're giving us a different picture, you know, how the brain functions, how we physiologically function. Because again, normally when we're in this thing of health and medicine, we locate problems within the individual. We say this person has hypertension, this person has this psychiatric disorder. And what you're giving us as a vision of is human beings respond to their environment. And if environments are problematic, that can lead to poor health. That's exactly right. And what I say is what you need to change is the prediction. You need to change that for individuals, but the way to do that uh, very often is that you, I mean, you can tell a black person you need to not be worried about whether you, your, you or your son is going to be shot, but that's pointless unless the society understands that black lives matter, basically. Uh, that's a very poignant way to put it. Uh, now, in the 1970s, you became involved with psychiatry, and you publicly spoke critically about several of its treatments. So, so how did that come about? It was uh, fortuitous. Somebody, a visitor to our house, uh, brought a copy of the New York Post, and, uh, which was a decent paper at the time, and said, did you see this? They're operating, they're doing brain surgery on children to uh, cure their behavior. I said, nah, come on. But I looked it up and I found the article and uh, I found uh, a gazillion references to the fact that this was happening on children and adults and drug addicts. And there was prisoners in, in jails and it was psychosurgery was still being done by leading surgeons at Harvard uh, Medical School and, and Yale and, and Columbia. I mean, I was shocked. And so I began to read about it, and I asked my colleagues, do you know about No, no, I didn't know about this. So um, I just got involved. In all of these things, my first effort is to understand, is there something good here? Is there some value in this? Uh, because if there is, well, I, I, I think I'll be quiet. But if there isn't, you know, I think I have to speak up. And, you know, this is removing your frontal lobe, your amygdala, or your cingulate gyrus is just uh, – it's a disaster. It's a, it's a terrible, it's just terribly foolish thing to do, really. So I, I, I looked at that, and then I discovered, oh, well, drugs, what about the drugs? Antipsychotics uh, in particular. Antipsychotic drugs, yeah. At that time was mainly uh, chlorpromazine and the related drugs, and that they were causing their own sort of brain damage, tardive dyskinesia, which was being denied by the psychiatrists who were administering it, but it turned out to be, there was a few decent, honest psychiatrists who were saying, gosh, no, this is a, it's a mistake. And then I found the same thing was true for uh, electroshock treatment as well. So I began to read and testify about that. When you say testify, testify before Congress? or I testified, uh, number one, uh, through uh, at several state hearings about electroshock treatment that it was really a brain a damaging thing. The other thing I got into shock is that the New Yorker magazine published an article by Burton Roche, who was their medical writer. He wrote these mystery stories. And he, he wrote an article called Empty as Eve. 
and I don't remember, it was early 70s, was about a woman who'd completely lost her memory following a shot treatment or a series of shot treatments. And um, I wrote to Roche and said, uh, gosh, uh, I'm a neuroscientist. I'm interested in this. Could you put me in touch with this woman? I'd like to talk to her. So he did. Her name was Marilyn Rice. And I corresponded with her. I met her a number of times and uh, uh, got her story. And so I began to testify that, uh, as you would expect, any neuroscientist would expect if you put electrodes across people's head and gave them that kind of a shock, that you, a series of shocks, it's not one, it's multiple treatments over time, you would do damage. And of course, you do. So I began to testify. Uh, New York State had hearings. Uh, in fact, they had hearings in the 1970s, early 70s. Then 30 years later, they had them again. And I went back, I testified in Texas. But one more place I testified was in terms of drugs. This was probably my most successful uh, experience, was that the mental patients in a New Jersey state hospital had an advocate, a lawyer advocate, who sued the state of New Jersey, uh, the head of mental health in the state of New Jersey, for the right to refuse uh, neuroleptic drugs, antipsychotic drugs, because they said it makes us feel terrible and it, and it causes brain damage. So this appeared in federal district court in New Jersey. And I testified on behalf of the plaintiffs uh, saying, look, uh, it, it does damage. And so that it's rational for you to refuse the treatment. So the judge actually, this is in 1979, ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. And I wrote an article for the New Republic at the time. It was titled Psychiatry's Drug Addiction. So uh, the patients were awarded the right to refuse treatment. And then the, the case was appealed in federal uh, appeals court in Philadelphia. And in five minutes, the, uh, the judges said, no, no, we can't. We, we cannot accept this. And they just kicked it out because they said judges cannot be the final arbiter of who's going to get medicines. What was the name of the New Jersey case? The case was called Rennie versus Klein. Yeah, that was a famous case in the right to refuse treatment. I didn't realize you were the uh, one of the expert witnesses in that. If That's you type in Rennie versus Klein Sterling, yeah. you'll find my New Republic uh, article on the wow. online. That's really fascinating. So what I'd like to do now is we, we go back to this question. What does our species require for a healthy life? And I'd like to start with the worm brain and how it manifests in a way in the human brain. This is good. Good question. So first of all, the worm brain, uh, which was the first brain of a multicellular bilateral organism. So we are descended from this worm. It's only half a billion years. It, it didn't take that long, actually, once we got a worm. And the worm has a, uh, and the earliest brains have a special circuit that drives us animal or a human to search, you know, to move. We look for food, we look for shelter, we look for comfort. The worm was looking for the right uh, acidity, the right water temperature, salinity, mates. And the rule was when you find something that's good that you need, there's a circuit that releases a special uh, chemical that says, okay, relax, you found it. Chill. You know, this is this is where you need to be. And the chemical is called dopamine. And this chemical and the circuit of both the searching circuit and the reward, which is dopamine, uh, was preserved for half a billion years. And the reason we are now understanding, the people who study the mathematics of reward learning show that this is an optimal strategy. If you're looking for something that you f find that's unexpected, you have what's called a reward prediction error. You're predicting you needed something, and this now you found it, and this is the best strategy. So that's one thing we, we can see in this environment, that uh, we are primed or built to seek out experiences, a way of life that actually does uh, reward us with dopamine release. So let's now talk about a second feature in terms of our evolutionary makeup that made Homo sapiens so successful, our big brain. 
Yes. I would like just to make one more point about the dopamine. The thing about the dopamine is it's one chemical that rewards us for all kinds of activities. And what's critical is that they be surprising. Uh, we were looking for food. We didn't really know what to expect, but here we find some. We find a little something here or there. And we get just a tiny little drop of dopamine. And then we go on to the next activity. And we're driven constantly. This circuit, which goes back to the worm, drives us to seek and to find little surprises. And so our whole behavior, our whole selfhood is really organized around these frequent small surprises. And if we don't find them, we get very uh, uncomfortable. We continue to seek. We get agitated. So, so the dopamine is a reward, but it's, not, it's an obligation of what we need to live to keep seeking and finding small, small rewards that are unexpected. Okay. So now let's go on to these big brains. The first point is that I, I have written a book my first book with Simon Laughlin is called Principles of Neural Design, published first in 2015. And one of the points it makes is that to have a brain that uh, can beat a supercomputer in many respects, a uh, supercomputer occupies a room, a high, big room. It requires mega, megawatts of electricity. Our brain fits in the space of a milk carton and it operates uh, with less electricity than a refrigerator light bulb. So it has an amazing efficiency for computation. And one of the key things is that uh, it's specialized. So everything that you do compute, if you do it with a little specialized circuit, it's more efficient than a computer, which doesn't can't do that. So we evolved, uh, you know, among many specializations, our cerebral cortex divided into many complex areas. Each, each area has multiple circuits in it, but the rule is specialize. Once you have the skull filled with brain and it's got 200 areas, uh, you're stuck. That's all you can compute as an individual. You can't make the brain very much larger because you have to re-engineer the whole body uh, it becomes more expensive. It's already using 20% of our total energy, and so on. So the strategy that we evolved as human beings was to specialize between individuals. So each individual uh, in a community has may have 200 roughly areas, but they're not the same areas. So some people are very alert at, at uh, tracking and hunting but they can't really recognize other people's faces. Other people know every fa never forget a face. Th those are the people who become politicians, uh, social people, but uh, they, they need to cooperate with the hunters and so on. You can imagine each skill. Some people make tools. Some people uh, know how to build a boat, uh, navigate, and so on. Musicians, storytellers, comedians. And so, um, so you generate a small community who start out with different talents, innate talents. That's part of our thing. We were born with certain special things. Uh, Mozart wasn't just going to school to learn music. It, he came out of the womb with something in him. So the thing is that the, the, uh, the dopamine effect is when you practice something and you get better at it, you see an improvement, you get some dopamine from that. And the dopamine has a role in all of learning. It stimulates you to repeat and practice. And when you practice, you get better. Your brain changes. And so by the time you're an adult, um, the things that you practiced as a child have built up. This is what happens when people specialize. And so what it means is that if you grow up habitually uh, predicting bad things, you adapt your behavior. Your whole brain is really shaped to anticipate these bad things. And to move away from that, you have to find new ways to get new predictions and practice new predictions. And it's, it's very difficult. It, you can change your brain at any time, but it's a, uh, it's a struggle. What you've just described really is, you might call it a philosophy of being based in neuroscience. There's a sense of 
how human beings were shaped by evolution and how they move through that environment. And now let's move into the conceptions that are given to us by modern psychiatry and see if they fit with that philosophy of being, if, if that makes sense. So we'll start with DSM-3. The, in 1980, the American Psychiatric Association publishes its uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. They say they adopt a medical model, but they really adopt a disease model. They say if you have certain behaviors or certain feelings uh, that in any way impair your functioning, that's a psychiatric disorder. You know, they'll, they'll list certain behaviors and say the abnormal people are on this side and the normal people are on this side. So first of all, does that categorization of human beings <laughs> where you draw a line over here are some people, they're ill, the rest of us are normal. Is that, does that fit with your understanding of us as a species? So first, in some cases, there are things that I would, I would uh, accept as a disease. Uh, childhood diabetes, for example, for some reason, your immune system attacks your pancreatic uh, beta cells and wipes them out. And so you have no source of insulin. And I, I accept this as a, as a disease and that the treatment is to replace the insulin that's missing as a rational treatment. So that I want to make clear is I'm not a denier of neurological and mental not, illness. Yeah. But um, there are many other uh, behavioral issues and experiences that I think are really uh, not diseases, but they come on as part of behavioral traits. And a behavioral trait, I mean, let's, being tall is a, is a trait, height is a trait, and it's controlled by hundreds of, of genes. And if you get 100 genes for tall and a few genes for short, you're going to be very tall, way out on the distribution of height. So I would, I would take, for example, uh, particularly because I'm reviewing the literature and writing about it now, um, the, the trait that uh, would be described as ADHD, um, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. So the, the article I'm writing, tentative title now is Tom Sawyer was a, you know, a character in American literature. He's maybe the character in American literature who's full of energy, imagination, devilment. He, he's always in trouble in school. He's, uh, he pays no attention to authority. And, and yet, we would be bereft without this character in American literature. If he was in a classroom today of 30 people, he would definitely be identified as a, uh, somebody who had this disorder, and, and he would very likely be treated with stimulant drugs, which are, of course, the drug that we outlawed. Ritalin, amphetamines have the same action as cocaine, and methamphetamine. So these are these are drugs of abuse, basically. But we give them to children who behave in a classroom like Tom Sawyer. This is a, of course, a a trait. And so if you move a little to the left, so the average people are calmer. They're less impulsive. They are better at waiting till a teacher calls on them, and so on. And if you go to the right, you have children who simply cannot sit still in a classroom and really shouldn't be in a classroom. They should be doing something outside. The ADHD is a great example of maybe some flaws with the philosophical conception of human beings. Because if we go back to your earlier uh, talk about the brain and how there's specialization and how those different specializations all contribute to the group success, you could see why, in fact, maybe if you have some people who, as they're growing up, are paying a lot of attention to environmental things rather than a narrow focus, that would actually be to the group's benefits. So going back to this spectrum, obviously the kids that are not adapting to the uh, school environment, they're on this spectrum of variation within the human species. And I think that's why ADHD is such a good example, in my opinion, of some of the philosophical flaws of the DSM. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And uh, I would add a couple of points to this. One is about the brain is that we don't do multitasking. When we are focused on an issue, we're focused on that particular issue and everything else falls away. And so one of the key things in the whole 
brain is to, it, the brain decides what needs to be it pay attention to now. And a lot of times in a classroom, the complaint is that the child is not paying attention to the teacher. But the child's mind is not blank. It's paying, to, it's paying attention to his internal voices, okay, and uh, what's going on. Uh, when I'm in a lecture, I'm thinking, well, what do I want for dinner or many other things. And there's no particular reason why any individual should be more attentive to the teacher than what's in his own mind. This is a, uh, you know, a very deep issue. I didn't meet very many teachers who I would say deserved more attention than I gave them. Well, what, what, what about the thing about a classroom? Who's really more important to the child, the teacher or the peers? I mean, one of the things you're learning about is socializing among the peers. And we put a lot of importance when we're growing up and being successful with our peers. And I think we're pretty motivated to be successful with our peers. And one of the things that Ritalin does, supposedly, it makes you less social. So really, you could say the kid who's not paying attention to the teacher may be attending to something that's more important in a way. Totally. One other point is that right now I'm, I'm reading William James, uh, who is a famous uh, Harvard psychologist at the turn of the last century. He wrote a book called The Varieties of Human Religious Experience. And one of the things he points out is that over and over again is we have this tremendously rich internal interior uh, mental life. And many, many people, all of the saints, the lives of the saints, when you read them, many uh, religious leaders and so on, all describe um, this intense experience of unification, of conversion. Uh, and they describe this as they heard a voice, they saw a vision, they heard music, they all kinds of um, internal experience that is critical for human uh, spiritual life. And uh, it's, it's not that distinguishable from traits of schizophrenia, you know, or, or bipolar disorder and so on. So um, I would say that going beyond ADHD, so many of these other disorders that are, if you're on the tail of the distribution, you can be really a problem to yourself or others, but sort of a little ways off the tail you are uh, inspired and you, you inspire others. And so these experiences that our capacity is built into our brain to have this interior life. And it's part of our species. So let's right. go forward now. You write about deaths of despair rising in the United States in recent times. First of all, what's the data for it? And then what do you attribute to that rise of deaths of despair in modern society? Okay, so the death rates of middle aged. Uh, Europeans and Australians and Canadians have been coming down since the 1990s, just in a fairly steep way for various reasons. The U.S. was right on track until about 1995. And then the death rate for, say, 50-year-olds, white 50-year-olds, began to rise deeply. I mean, our death rate compared to uh, 50, compared to the French is, you know, maybe twofold greater. It's really a very marked uh, phenomenon. So when I give talks, people say, well, why, why is that? And the, the steepest rise, cause is what was called by, I didn't make the term up, by, um, by two Princeton economists, um, deaths of despair. And that includes um, suicide, drug addiction, overdose, uh, of, of which there are 60 or 70,000 deaths per year in the U.S. now. And so those are the main causes, uh, overdose, alcoholism, and uh, suicide. And, and it's worse by the decade. So if you were born in my decade, there's very, relatively low uh, incidence of that. If you were 50 years old and you were born in 1970, you crossed the 100 deaths per 100,000 at age 45. If you were born in 1980, you crossed this threshold uh, at age 35. So it's a serious problem for earlier, more recent generations. I think the core root of the problem is that our huge brains uh, require, and our spiritual life of many generations requires uh, that 
when we were hunter gatherers, we found interesting work to do throughout our whole life cycle. At about age 20, we learned, finally began to feed ourselves. And until then, we were shown to improve your skill at hunting and gathering continues up into age 45. It takes a very long time to learn how to hunt, what animals to follow, what to, when to give up, when to keep going. Uh, same thing for uh, gathering foods. So this is a lifetime of learning and of contributing to the community. And even after age 60, you're still contributing to uh, the community's food. Now we have two things. One, um, we, many, many jobs are learned in you know five minutes, if, if, if that. And uh, they're just routine things, stamping a passport, scanning a barcode, God knows what. And uh, these really do not occupy a brain that is as magnificent as ours. I mean, uh, so people with that sort of work really sort of uh, slowly go mad. The other thing is that most of what we used to find food and comfort uh, in a sort of a random way and get a little drop of dopamine. Now, when you walk into a supermarket, you know what you're going to find uh, on aisle seven. And uh, so there's really not very much dopamine to get from that. And you only get it by having something that's even richer or alcohol or drugs. They all are sought after because they release dopamine. So we have on the one hand, really crappy work. We have a destroyed community, which has very little interconnection. And uh, we have you know, people who are isolated. And the only way they can become comfortable with themselves in their isolation is by, uh, by taking drugs that release great surges of dopamine. And the problem is that the brain is designed to adapt to these large levels of dopamine by reducing the dopamine receptors, and so you need more. So we, we become addicted to the rich food, to the drugs, to the alcohol, and, and, and all the other things. And that, I think, is a, the despair. It's, it's poor work, social isolation, and reliance on these other sources. In a way, you could say we're, we don't have an environment that nurtures yeah. our worm-inherited brain. A couple more questions. Going back to the beginning... You know, what does our species require for a healthy life, which you've pretty much set forth here? And can we achieve this with drugs? And there was in the last 50 years this sense of, you know, better living through chemistry. And then, of course, in the 80s, we got Prozac, which we were told that could make you better than well. So what's the story with can we fix this with drugs? If we're adapted, we're built to be in a certain environment, to be curiosity seeking, you know. Now we're talking about pharmaceutical drugs. Can they fix it? No, of course not. This is a delusion. If you have a specific loss, as I was suggesting for insulin, there's a certain logic to, yes, replacing the substance with an artificial drug uh, that in some way addresses this specific deficit. But if you're talking about human despair, uh, no, that involves the whole brain with many complex circuits. And, uh, and if you try to, and same thing with high blood pressure, if you try to treat uh, high blood pressure, which is caused by the correct prediction that you're going to be maybe uh, harassed or shot or something like that, uh, your brain is predicting that there's danger. If you try to treat that with one drug, the brain ad adapts and it raises the pressure and then you get another drug. And the same thing goes on until you're taking five drugs and each of those causes a side effect. So you're taking drugs to suppress the side effects and so on. You are about to expand on what is health. So what is health? Well, I think what is health is paying attention uh, to the human life cycle, which is uh, as we evolved. And of course, we're not going to go back to being hunter gatherers. But I think we need to understand uh, better what, what we need to preserve in that life. And that is children need uh, attention from multiple parents and generations. And you can't just stick children off in a corner uh, and expect them to be okay. Adults need activities, work that will provide 
for their material needs, but will actually dignify the brains that they have. So that means making sure that we have activities that attract adults to continue their own education, which is which is what the hunter gatherers did, you know, for their with their energy. We need a spiritual life. You cannot uh, expect to have the human interior life just be stimulated by a by a screen and pushing buttons on a screen. It involves participatory activities, playing music together, singing together, and uh, sexual life that doesn't. I mean, porn. Uh, pornography attracts a huge following, but it's like pushing a button and getting sex. It, it can do something for somebody for a few times, but it can't replace a rich sexual life. So there, there's the artificiality of, of current technology, which really strips human beings of the opportunity to exercise their, their physical and emotional and metabolic uh, lives. And I think that's what we need to to pay attention to. So that's well put. Now imagine you're the mental health czar for the United States. You're responsible for trying to help us create an environment that will lead to less psychiatric distress, uh, you know, better mental health. What sort of plan would you put forward for achieving that goal? Sure. Well, I'll start with the um, my answer to the question uh, which I'm asked in, in lectures, well, what does Europe know? So the first answer is, well, Europe has, number one, four to six weeks paid vacation for every adult. And if you drive in Boston and you experience the insanity of porn talking, swearing, and so on, you will manage, imagine these people with four to six weeks vacation, it would change. Europe has uh, support for public medicine, okay? So if you didn't have to worry about where your medicine was coming from, or your children's education and uh, child care. If you, if you did the natural social supports that uh, modern, advanced modern societies have, this would do a huge effect for Americans' mental health. Okay, that's one thing. Number two, if we would pay attention to the actual condition of children, so children shouldn't have to worry about being evicted, uh, where they're going to sleep. I mean, imagine children... Having uh, families having to worry about enough food in this country is, is just insane. So children should not be anxious about whether they can be provided for materially, and their families shouldn't be so disrupted by alcoholism and, and street violence and so on. So you, you have to make stronger families, and that would happen if there was better um, support, guaranteed support for families. Finally, when you get to the classroom, uh, this model of a classroom was sticking 30 kids in a room and telling them to shut up for an hour all day uh, really is, is crazy. And so we need to re reform the schools to better match the distribution of capacity abilities of children in the population. So if there's, a, if there's a musical child who can't sit still, get them out there, stick an instrument in them, their hands and and let them work on that. So it would be pretty easy to reorganize uh, U.S. education along the lines of developing people's talents instead of uh, compressing them into this, into this mold, which is really intolerable. How about the need for play among kids? Oh, yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, this is the way children learn. Actually, children growing up in, in pre-modern societies spent enormous amount of time with each other across a range of ages. So young children learn from older children. And when young, in, in our farm where we are here now in Panama, um, there's a range of kids from cradle to, you know, in their 20s, and they, uh, they play soccer together, okay? And of course, the little kids aren't as good as the big kids, but if the, if the big kids just crushed them, there wouldn't be it wouldn't be any fun. So the teams are mixed and uh, and people have a good time playing and, and winning is you know it's not the main thing. So uh, I think the range of, of age education and supervision and cooperation. So play uh, is a huge component of learning and very much social uh, education. Peter, it's been a fascinating interview. Much food for thought. I really enjoyed it. So thank you for your time and uh, 
I recommend everybody read What is Health? Thank you, Bob. I, I've enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.